Hello. Uh, so great um, to be here and being joined by great speakers and discussants today. Uh, so today we're going to discuss about the future of the Arab world 10 years after the Arab Spring. Uh, Arab Spring, roughly 10 years ago, have started with great expectations. Uh, simply the ex expectations were that it's, the Middle East is going to witness a more inclusive political adventure and the people's demands in all of this, uh, the discourse of the history is going to be finally rationalized, maybe through the states and states institutions. But shortly after that, great expectations, particularly uh, by the counter-revolution forces coming into the stage, uh, the, 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 the picture has completely got a real change. And uh, in specific, uh, the counter-revolution that happened in Egypt, in a sense, has killed lots of these uh, great expectations. And uh, the maybe to a certain extent, the despair has been placed by that. So now, the last 10 years of the Arab Spring, most probably is going to be a stage that's going to be determining the future of the Arab world, maybe for the next 10 years. So as we can see, particularly by the uh, counter-revolution forces uh, and by the support coming from the West, at least the silence from the West, now we are witnessing a conflict uh, between the societies and their states. So it is a kind of conflict of the change and those who want to keep the status quo. Uh, unfortunately, the states, with the exception of Tunisia, the states could not achieve uh, a peace with their own citizens. The tensions is still there, and it's a fertile, fertile ground for maybe many of the geopolitical surprises for the next uh, decade. Uh, so I'm pleased to announce that today we are joined by uh, great speakers and discussants. Uh, so the format is going to be uh, for the uh, first uh, session of this uh, roundtable discussion. Each of our speakers is going to have his own presentation and if possible, keeping it between five minutes to eight minutes. And then once the presentations from the uh, speakers are uh, done, we are going to shift to the uh, second session of this discussion with the participants. The discussants are also going to join us. So I would like to introduce the speakers, the esteemed speakers, uh, Mr. Mukhtar uh, Lamani is uh, with us, the former ambassador of OIC to United Nations, and Mr. Uh, Saeed uh, Farjani is going to join us soon. We are unfortunately facing a uh, technical uh, problem. Our friends are trying to solve it. Once it's, it's solved, it's going to be joining us. Uh, Mr. Said Farjani is an MP in Tunisia and senior official of Nahda Party. And we are joined by uh, Shadi Hamid, senior fellow at Brookings Institute, and uh, Jamal Al Shayal, senior correspondent uh, at Al Jazeera Media Network. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mukhtar Lamani, I would like to go uh, first uh, with you. We are ready to, uh, to, to, to listen to your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rasul. It's a pleasure and honor. And uh, let me begin even in five minutes. It's uh, too short by thanking the organizer for uh, this yearly initiative, uh, gathering so many interesting and, uh, people and having very good ideas. Uh, of course, uh, 10 years after uh, the Arab Spring, and uh, despite the current uh, chaos in the region, known for its uh, political stagnation, generalized corruption and its uh, repression as the only way of governance, uh, some unprecedented transformations took or are uh, taking place. Some of the most important of this transformation is the desertization uh, 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 of uh, political used and sclerotic powers responsible of political and socio-economic blockage uh, known in uh, the society. Of course, the situation in its different country 
uh, is different, as you mentioned, you know, the specific case of uh, Tunisia, as well, I would like, you know, just to mention some words for the second wave of the Arab Spring uh, that was stopped by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the current situation uh, looks worse. Civil wars, sectarianism, uh, emergence of a brutal and uh, unprecedented extremism, particularly bankrupt states, uh, in a way that uh, we were witnessing, you know, uh, since the 70s, 80s, a new notion in international law, which is a, a failed state. Uh, what's happening in, in this, we might have a new uh, uh, notion, which is a, a failed region. The whole region uh, can be considered as, as failed. Uh, the dangers that are threatening the future of the region have never been so pressing. And of course, the most uh, dangerous of which is the religious uh, uh, extremism. This uh, uh, religious extremism is, by definition, evolves uh, very well in troubled water, waters and risks, uh, tipping the whole region into a project contrary to the democratic ideals of the young people uh, who uh, launched the Arab Spring uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the highly uh, conflicting uh, regional and international agendas don't ease the tensions and they are adding so many things that we are also witnessing some new element in uh, international law. If you remember, during the Cold War, uh, the most extremist uh, for, uh, to resolve any uh, regional crisis will the superpower, the Soviet Union, and the, the American and uh, the state, because in the region, people were so scared that the crisis can cross the border and come to them. What we were witnessing in the crisis uh, after the Arab Spring, either in Iraq or in Syria, the, the most extremists were the regional, not, uh, 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 not the international uh, with the, the, these uh, conflicting agendas. Also, the strategy of the international uh, community Lacks, uh, resp uh, lacks uh, responsiveness uh, in setting clear objectives and the means to achieve them. Thus, uh, the recent uh, uh, losses of the ISIS in Iraq as well as in Syria seem to be offset by some gains elsewhere, particularly in the neighboring region of the Sahel, south of the Arab world. Uh, the Arab Spring must be included uh, in a long-term uh, analysis, not uh, notwithstanding the attempts by the forces of Islamist uh, conservatism or the counter-revolutionary attempts by the dominant elites since independence uh, uh, block uh, any serious commitment to real democratizations. Of course, revolutions and their success are not measured in months or years. It is a slow, and very deep social movement that requires uh, continuous uh, uh, corrections. We cannot measure them uh, the life of a human being, and we do not have to forget, for example, one of the references of a, a big change in democratization as well as in human rights, which is the French Revolution. A lot of people they seem to forget that after the French Revolution in 1789, almost uh, half a century, it was a total chaos before things took the path that uh, uh, we know. I would like to say also that we witnessed some kind of corrections with the second wave of the Arab Spring that took place, especially in Sudan, Lebanon, and Algeria, and how it was very well organized, much more uh, than the, the first wave, trying to correct, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic that, that stopped everything. And it seems that in Sudan, we were witnessing that things are taking, uh, in a way, the example of Tunisia. And also the most, uh, the, the best surprise we got is the young people of uh, Lebanon, uh, in a society that is very well known by uh, sectarianism, to have all these young people from different sects, from different religions, demonstrating their own elites, asking for a, a real democracy. I think my five minutes, uh, are finished now we will develop if there are some other things through the kind of questions we can have thank you very much for listening thank you very much for this insightful uh, presentation
Um, so uh, now we pass into uh, Mr. Shadi Hamid, the uh, senior fellow at Brookings Institute. So Hamid, please. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Good to be with all of you. I'll make two main points. Um, the first on repression and how we understand that word. And then the second point I'll make is about the U.S. role. So on repression, I'll start on a depressing note. Uh, I think one of the major lessons of the Arab Spring, unfortunately, is that repression works. It doesn't necessarily work in the long run, and I'll get to that in a moment, but in the short to medium term, repression can be very effective. And we've seen that in a number of countries. The most obvious example is Egypt, where you didn't have just Mubarak style repression, where the opposition was banned and restricted, but tolerated to some degree. We see um, full-blown authoritarianism, almost something akin to totalitarianism, where there simply isn't any room for political competition. And you might recall that during the start of the Arab Spring, we heard a lot of rhetoric about how the wall of fear has been destroyed and that Arab, the Arab world will never be the same again, that Arabs will never be submissive. They will be, they will be insistent on their rights and dictatorships won't be able to put them down. What we have found out, however, is that the wall of fear can be rebuilt and it can be rebuilt perhaps even more strongly than it was before. Now, the question then is what happens after the short to medium term? What is the long-term view? We know that repression can be effective, but it doesn't stay effective forever. And there's two interesting examples worth mentioning here. The first is Syria after the Hama massacre of 1982. It took Syrians about, um, uh, 20, uh, let's see, 29 years or so to actually regain the confidence and, and the energy, let's say, to protest en masse. And that obviously happened in 2011 with the start of the Arab Spring. So in some sense, it can take a generation. That's how effective repression can be. It can take a very long time to recover. The other example is the Algerian Civil War, uh, which started in 1992, and then Algeria had its democratic opening starting last year, which is a gap of 27 years. Again, this is a very long time. But what it does tell us is that repression can't last forever, and it doesn't necessarily work in the long run. And I think there's a broader premise here, um, is that authoritarian regimes don't last forever. They are, by definition, temporary. Now, the question is, how long is the long run? And this is where it becomes very difficult from an outside perspective. If you're a U.S. policymaker, you're concerned usually with the next four to eight years or even less, the next year maybe. So how do you prioritize the long run over the short term? And that's going to be a tension in any country's foreign policy. But I think the thing that's worth remembering is that there is an illusion of stability. Let's take the Sisi regime, for example. It seems stable and it will be stable until it's not. And then it's too late. And you don't know exactly when that moment will happen. So now to my second point, I'll say something about the predicament that the U.S. finds itself in. And also, as we look to the Biden administration and try to think about how they're going to approach the Arab region, the U.S. has been hampered for uh, several decades now by something that I would call the Islamist dilemma, that we, we as Americans, we say we want democracy in theory, but we're afraid of democracy's outcomes in practice. And there is a real tension and conflict there. And up until now, various administrations have not been able to find a resolution to this dilemma. It hampered the, the, uh, the second Bush administration after 9-11, where after Islamist parties did well in elections in Palestine, Lebanon, and Egypt, the Bush administration backed down 
from supporting uh, democratic reform and fell back on authoritarian regimes. And obviously, we know what happened with the Obama administration's mixed messages on the Egyptian coup and uh, turning a blind eye to some degree to uh, when the Rabah massacre happened. The list is long. What I would argue is that if the U.S. ever wants to get serious about supporting democracy in the Middle East, um, it will have to be comfortable with Islamist parties playing some role. And, and because Islamist parties, they might not necessarily win, but they will at least do well in elections. And sometimes they will actually win outright. And until the U.S. comes to terms with that basic proposition, we're going to be stuck in this Islamist dilemma. And this is not to say that Islamist parties are good or bad. Even if you think Islamists are bad, that that does um, that shouldn't have any bearing on the broader question, because what is democracy? Ultimately, democracy, in part, is about the right to make the wrong choice. Democracy is about making bad choices, bad in quotation marks, because obviously citizens disagree on what a good choice is and what a bad choice is. And this is where the U.S. has to be comfortable with supporting a process rather than supporting certain outcomes. So we shouldn't be supporting Islamists. We shouldn't be supporting secularists or liberals. We should be supporting a democratic process. The last thing I'll say, though, is there is a question should be supporting whether we as Americans should be supporting democracy in the first place. And that's where we get back to fundamental principles. And there are obviously some people, including in the current administration, the Trump administration, that would say quite openly and frankly that the U.S. should not be supporting democracy um, in the Middle East at all. And that's a certain approach that we've seen for the last four years. Democrats generally say that democracy is important, um, at least rhetorically. The practice is something different. But the basic argument, and I'll close with this, is that we have seen the results of relying on authoritarian regimes for the past several decades. And I think the empirical record is clear. We have seen um, the outbreak of civil war in several countries. Let's, there's probably four concurrent civil wars going on right now. We've obviously seen the rise of terrorism um, with ISIS and Al-Qaeda, 9-11, obviously being the, the case that is most relevant to the U.S. And we've also seen more recently how um, instability that results from civil war um, spills over into countries like Europe and which creates instability and the rise of right wing populism um, in the European context. So we see a lot of spillover effects. And at some point we have to ask ourselves um, if the, if supporting authoritarian regimes, if business as usual is producing a violent, conflictual, unstable Middle East, at some point we have to ask ourselves, are we going to continue doing the same thing even though we know it produces these very problematic outcomes? So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deh, uh, for this remarkable uh, presentation. So now, Jamal al Shayel, uh, senior correspondent at Al Jazeera. So Jamal, please. Thank you very much, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Just to get straight into it, obviously, I think it's one of the things, the questions that we need to look at when we're assessing what's happened over the past 10 years, when we're assessing the Arab Spring and trying to take heed from it, what we can predict, is just to question why it happened. And there's been a lot of discussions about it. People who believe, uh, you know, the main trigger was an economic one. Others who believe uh, that, uh, you know, from from the the, the bizarre uh, uh, conspiracy theories that the anti-coup, or rather, sorry, the anti-revolutionary uh, uh, forces put out that this was some sort of Israeli-American plot to divide the Arab world even more than it's divided to uh, the more kind of uh, academic uh, assessments of this is just simply uh, people revolting because they weren't uh, uh, able to, to, to put food on the table. There is a mixture of things 
that took place in 2010, late 2010, 2011. But the reality is that th those things were fermenting in the Arab world for several years. As a journalist reporting, I was in Mahalla in Egypt in 2008 when the April 6th movement uh, kind of erupted and those protests happened. In fact, one of the first times people took to the streets and took to Tahrir Square in particular and protested was all the way back in 2005 that I could remember uh, uh, as well. And it was something that brewed uh, up. So the question is here, is why did the uh, millions of people across the Arab world choose to uh, take a route of mass protests and try and topple regimes that others would have seen to provide quote unquote stability uh, and security? Why were thousands of people willing to risk their lives and ultimately uh, their, 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 their livelihoods and, and uh, uh, were killed for uh, what reasons? To look at the Arab world uh, detached from the fact that it has essentially been uh, under some sort of foreign rule or influence and has never really uh, experienced any real freedom for the good best part of uh, 100 years would be uh, essentially getting rid of the main cause for uh, a lot of the uh, movements that have been occurring. To look at the Arab world detached from the ongoing illegal occupation of Palestine and all that comes with it would be to be blind uh, to the real cause of a lot of the instability in the Arab world. And I can say that as a journalist who covered the protests in Egypt, Libya, uh, uh, Yemen and Syria, where in every main square where these anti-government protests took place during the Arab Spring, there were the flags of that country married to or with Palestinian flags. There were chants of uh, what, uh, you know, toppling the regime with either things like, for example, in Egypt, where, where we'd say, you know, uh, uh, why are you sending your troops? Do you think we're Zionists or what? This was one of the uh, uh, chants that the protesters had uh, and, and so forth. So this is something that I think is very significant. Now, that gives you the context of... Uh, a population that has been under some sort of colonialism, be it cultural, economic, or actual military, a region that uh, has had a foreign entity enforced on it, uh, which has essentially established itself as a political, economic, and um, military uh, superpower uh, against all uh, the other region, uh, all the other countries uh, in the region, and nothing to show for it. Ultimately, those who have been asked to stay silent about uh, these things maybe would have been able to continue staying silent, let's say, if the education systems in the Arab world were good or if the economic prospects for their children were good. Those are the secondary issues to it, in my view. Once people decided that there was no hope after li living those 20, 30, 40 years under the Assads and the Mubaraks and the Qaddafis of the region and decided to take things into their hands, the danger then, the fault lines changed. And here are the fault lines, uh, and I would disagree somewhat with uh, what uh, His Excellency, the former ambassador said, isn't necessarily about uh, religious extremism on one hand and other. The fault lines in the Arab world very simply right now are between those who believe in pluralism and those who view pluralism as an existential threat to the current systems. It's not about Islamist versus secularist. It is not about necessarily even the Arab Spring versus others. It is just this concept of pluralism because we can't even dream to see democracy if we can't even accept and implement the most basic tenets of it, which is to agree to disagree, to have some sort of pluralism, right? So on the one hand, you have countries like the United Arab Emirates, like Saudi Arabia, and like the military in Egypt who do not uh, have any room or scope to accept an alternative opinion. For them, pluralism will ultimately lead to a change in power because that's what it leads. If you accept that there is, uh, everybody has a right to a different point of view, the end of that road, the end of that argument is that everyone will have a right to choose how they are governed. Everyone will have a right to choose what policies to pursue. And therefore, we will then result in some sort of a political system that isn't the one that exists now, which is authoritarianism, which is absolute monarchy. On the other side of that debate, you have countries like Turkey, like Qatar, who aren't necessarily, I'm not talking about uh, utopian democracies here, but who do believe in pluralism to an extent, 
who are willing to sit uh, at the table with those who may not necessarily agree with them and at least believe that those who disagree with them still deserve the right to live shouldn't be massacred in the squares of Rabaa or in the uh, cities of Aleppo and so forth. Moving forward now, yes, uh, here Shadi made a good point that, you know, many people believed that the wall of fear, as it was called, was destroyed and so forth. And yes, it was very built up very quickly. But I think where 2011 failed and where the next wave of protests will succeed is that 2011 was very clear with what it was against. Right? So they were against Mubarak, they were against all these different uh, figures, but it had no idea of what it was for. And that's why, for example, the revolutionary forces, although united during the 18 days in Egypt, for example, only took a few weeks before they were divided, because there was no clear uh, vision where they could agree on one thing. Right? And what, by, by this, I think this is where the, the kind of political immaturity and inexperience and the you know, the results of decades of, of living under colonialism led to it, that you don't have that experience, but obviously hindsight is uh, 2020, as they say, that they didn't have the idea of let us cement, let us put some roots for a political process. Where Tunisia became a, a, a success story is because the focus was on trying to establish that process first, was trying to create a political environment that was welcoming to pluralism. In Egypt, the issue was about trying to flex muscles or trying to enforce a certain agenda before the game was dismantled, before what was set up for the past 30, 40 years was dismantled for it to be even replaced and built. So the next wave, I believe, we'll see relatively, not necessarily to the extent that we would like to see, but we'll see relatively more mature politicians, those who have experienced and seen the mistakes. Will there be a next wave? Maybe people will be asking. I think we've been seeing now in Egypt, the protests that took place in September. We will probably see something very soon, not necessarily just because people are against the rule of uh, uh, Al-Fatah Sisi, but because of his circle being so small now, the elimination and eradication of the public, private uh, sector, uh, closing the circle within the military itself, the economic situation, all the impacts that COVID-19 is having on the world, and particularly Egypt, this will give birth to something. What's that impact on the Arab world? We need to stop seeing, if there is one lesson that we learned from 2011, we need to stop seeing flash protests or specific events as if they are the be all and end all, as if they are definitive. Something that has been built, a system that has existed for decades is not going to be dismantled in 18 days. It definitely won't be rebuilt in 18 days. So my view is that there will be, and we're seeing the murmurings, we're seeing these things bubble up. There will be a second and third and fourth round, but it will, and ultimately this will uh, uh, result in a transformation of the political system in the Arab world. But the truth if if there is a truth that uh, the arab world needs to answer the same way the us needs to answer the question that shadi posed about whether it wants to accept democracy or not because obviously democracy would mean you know certain parties winning and so forth what people need to realize is there is no such thing as a popular movement in the arab world without the dismantling of monarchies in saudi arabia absolute dictatorships in Egypt and Syria and so forth. It's just not going to work out. So either there will be uh, Jamal, you know, an, inf Jamal, an infinite sorry. kind of... Uh, 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 yes. Sorry for interruption. Uh, we are exceeding the time. So could you please summarize it? Then in the uh, second part of the discussion, there will be questions toward you and then maybe you can take it from there. For sure. No, no, just to, to, to sum up on this point, the, the, the simple question that the Arab world needs to understand first and foremost is whether it's going to accept pluralism. And this is the first challenge it needs to do for it to have any hope of some sort of democracy. And second thing is to accept that the eventual result of having democracy in one of these countries will be having democracy in all of these countries. You can't separate the two. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal, for this remarkable presentation. So we are uh, joined by great, uh, remarkable discussants. Uh, Madavi Al-Rashid is with us, wisdom professor at LAC Middle East Center. Um, 
Maha Azam, head of the uh, Egyptian Revolutionary Council, is with us. Amar Kah, the executive director of uh, Omran for Strategic Studies and the board member of the Syrian Forum, is with us. Mr. Yasin Akta is with us. Yasin Akta yes, uh, is advisor to the chairman of AK Party, the ruling party in Turkey, and also a professor at Yildirim Bezd University. Mr. Ahmed Usal is with us. Uh, Mr. Ahmed is director of the Middle Eastern Studies Center and a professor at Istanbul University. Uh, we are joined by Iyad al-Baghdadi, who is the president of Kawakibi Foundation, and uh, Radwan Masmoudi, president of for the study of Islam and democracy in Washington, D.C. Uh, Elizabeth Nugget, uh, assistant professor at Yale University, is uh, with us. Uh, Courtney Freer, assistant professor, uh, uh, professoral uh, research fellow at uh, LSC and Shener Akturk, associate professor at Koch University and senior fellow at TRT World uh, Research uh, Center. Uh, thank you again for uh, being with us. Uh, if uh, right, I would like to uh, start with uh, Madhavi Al Rashid, the wisdom professor at LSC Middle East uh, Center. If any question or comment and the contribution, most welcome. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, very much enjoyed the discussion, uh, the presentation so far. But I think there is um, um, an element uh, or an angle missing in the way we look at the future of the Arab world. Uh, to me, the future looks very, very bleak. And uh, there are three interrelated problems that explain this uh, future that is not looking very good at the moment, uh, 10 years after the Arab uprising. I think the first level to look at is the domestic uh, chaos um, that has dominated the Arab world, uh, not only uh, in the last 10 years, but even before that. And this domestic chaos is related to uh, three elements, the economy, the politics of the region, and here I mean the, author, the persistent authoritarianism, and the social dynamics. Um, and, and these three had been aggravated by a, a third level, uh, a, sorry, a second level, and that is the regional level. The Arab world has lost its compass. It has lost a center it, uh, whereby uh, one could look for some kind of inspiration, some kind of defense of uh, basic rights. Uh, at the moment, the region is dominated by powers outside the Arab world. And here, I mean Iran, Turkey, and Israel. And more recently, we have a new axis emerging, and that is the Saudi-Israeli-Emirati axis, which promises to devastate the rights of Palestinians and also possibly instigate some regional wars with any of the power, regional powers in, in, the, in the Arab world. So th th this regional development is extremely worrying and it is led by Saudi Arabia and it is uh, assisted by Israel um, and other minor Arab uh, countries uh, in terms of their size, but in terms of their wealth, they can be extremely wealthy to create more dislocation and more wars in the region. And finally, there is an international scene that is equally chaotic, uh, equally uh, influenced by some kind of misconceptions about the Arab world. And here, I mean the United States, which had dominated the uh, uh, region um, uh, in terms of its economy and politics for a very long period of time. And I, I sometimes just uh, laugh when I hear American analysts saying that there is a retreat of American interest in the region and therefore that we are going to see instability. But 
I mean, any historian of the region will see that since the Second World War, the insecurity and instability of the Arab world was a direct response to American intervention uh, on behalf of certain forces, for example, Israel or the dictatorships in the Arab world, that had led to what we are seeing now, and that is the total collapse of states from Baghdad to Beirut or from Yemen to uh, uh, North Africa. Um, and therefore, uh, at the moment, we have this power vacuum uh, uh, that is not filled by any kind of uh, legitimate uh, uh, power from outside the region. American intervention had created so many wars um, in, in the region. Um, I, I don't want to go back to 1958 in Lebanon when they intervened on behalf of certain political leadership or to the uh, five, six, seven Israeli wars uh, on, on Arab countries um, and the loss of Palestinian rights. Uh, and more recently now we have this Israeli-Saudi axis that may drag the region in greater uh, sectarianism a war with Iran, and the people of the region are going to pay the, the ultimate uh, price, and it is going to be a heavy price. So in, to talk about democracy and what we mean by democracy, it's about pluralism or allowing the Islamists to come in. The Islamists are not the only uh, uh, players in the Arab world. They may be uh, uh, strong players organizationally, but we have seen other forces in the Arab world since 2011 regrouping, and those are people uh, asking for democracy. Uh, I just give you one example from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, since the 1970s, had a dominant Islamist movement, and this Islamist movement was seen by the regime as a, a, a force to cooperate with, but of course, they fell out with each other, and now they are the enemy number one of the Saudi regime. But in the last 10 years, um, the repression that has taken place in Saudi Arabia has meant that new forces are looking for real democracy, are emerging. They, their voices may not be heard, but the regime itself wants to project that the only is the only opposition is the Islamist. And believe me, many Saudis that I have worked with as, as an academic, as a researcher, uh, they do not want to replace the Saudi regime that has used and abused religion for over a century and vote for an Islamist opposition that wants to bring the, the population into the first Saudi Wahhabi pact of the 18th century. There are some varieties among the Islamists in Saudi Arabia as there are elsewhere. Some of them look backward um, and uh, the Wahhabi uh, tradition uh, in alliance with the Saudi regime wanted to maintain and preserve that. But today, the new leadership wants to throw that out and project itself as a liberal, a socially at least liberal, uh, uh, dictatorship. Um, there are others among the Islamists who look forward and are willing to learn from the experience of other countries and combine their Islamic tradition or Islamic faith um, and commitment to Islam with some kind of democratic process. However, those ones are in prison in Saudi Arabia, and I could just mention a few names, uh, uh, the founders of the Saudi Association for Human and Political Rights, known in Arabic as Hassam, uh, or some of the religious scholars who see a way of combining a, 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 a tradition of a commitment to Islam with a political system at the heart of which is democracy. So I think that if we want to talk about the future of the Arab world in, uh, over the coming decade or even longer, I see that these three uh, factors are going to intermingle and there will be a lot of devastation before there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But as uh, the previous speaker said, it is very difficult to see an even democratic development in the Arab world when we have a whole region 
a whole region entrenched in authoritarian repressive uh, governance. Uh, it is very unlikely that any experiment in democratization will succeed as long as there is wealth in countries that are wealthy, especially oil producing countries like Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries, pouring their resources in order to maintain a status quo of repression so that they don't look very odd in a region moving towards democratization. So if there is any hope for the Arab world, it has to be across the region rather than in single countries because the others, the wealthy ones, will fight that experiment and eventually kill it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rashid. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Iyad al-Baghdadi, president of uh, Kawakibi Foundation, uh, your contribution, comments, or questions are most welcome, please. Well, th thank you so much. Um, so we've, we've heard a lot of uh, doom and gloom, and uh, I want to present a different thesis here. I mean, anybody looking at the Middle East and North Africa region around, you know, around this 2020 would be excused if they see nothing but despair. Um, the, the region looks darker than it's ever been in a long time. Um, but I want to caution against um, you know, this kind of analysis mainly because it sends a message to decision makers around the world because if you're expecting this to be a stasis, if you're expecting this to be a terrible region for a long time, this sends a message to policymakers to check out for a decade or so. Um, and this is, you know, this actually is to the benefit of the dictators. I want to actually give you a different thesis. If you look side by side, there is of course the rise of a new generation. There, is, there are, of course, very important trends in demographics and economics in connectivity in the, you know, social media, uh, in education. This is, you know, this is a, this is basically an intergenerational transition, uh, you know, of, of epic proportion. This is the largest cohort of educated Arabs in Arab history. If you look here, you're going to see uh, that within this, this ecosystem, not a single uh, regime is sustainable you're going to see an ecosystem in which certain things are coexisting. You can see that you have uh, democratic transitions in some places. And I think that, you know, in our discussion so far, we've kind of privileged Egypt. Uh, it's important, it's an important country, but it's not the only country. Um, you can see democratic transitions in some places, refugee waves, terrorist, terrorist waves, proxy wars, stubborn resistance, uh, authoritarian consolidation, but also authoritarian collapse. Uh, you see the region bubbling with a lot of, you know, with, with really, with, with, with a lot of instability. I submit to you that this is exactly what a democratic transition looks like. This is an intergenerational, regional democratic transition, and these things do not happen over years. These ha they happen over decades. They happen over generations. The Arab Spring is not an event that happened in 2011. It's an era that started in 2011. We shouldn't say this is 10 years after the Arab Spring. We should be saying this is 10 years into the Arab Spring. This is a 30-year process. We're 10 years into a 30-year process. We have 20 years ahead of us. I know that this is not going to be easy, but if you consider the, the Mid Middle East and North Africa is home to, by some measures, nearly 700 million people. This is more than the population of the European Union. This is almost double the population of the United States. It is an event of enormous geopolitical significance when such a region democratizes, when you know 700 million people around the world are given political agency, they, they, they accomplish political agency for the first time. It's an enormous thing. It's not going to be easy and it's going to be, uh, frankly, it's going to change a lot of things. So that's why there, there are lots of forces working against it. Uh, so I, I just I just caution against uh, you know kind of tunnel vision and looking only in, in terms of uh, election cycles in the United States etc. I think we need to zoom out. Uh, the structure of Arab dictatorship was dealt a pretty like I mean I I just uh, sometimes ask the question the second wave of the Arab Spring that we started with that started in late 2018, uh, which I think you know I, I think uh, not not enough has been talked about especially Sudan. I think Sudan is an extremely important example not only because the Sudanese are kind of a non-Arab, Arabic-speaking country, but also because they had an Islamist dictatorship. 
Uh, and it's, for, it's, a, it's a country of 45 million people. So I, I, I'm kind of a little upset that we don't have a Sudanese interlocutor in, in, the, in this session. Um, but, th but there you have uh, th this, uh, th this uh, situation where um, uh, the counter-revolutionary axis, represented mostly by the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, uh, and in, in, you know, in, in a, to a lesser extent, Bahrain, are investing very deeply right now to, to subvert the, the, this, uh, this transition. Um, final point before I, I, I want to I want to be respectful of other people's time. I think that uh, the the axis that uh, uh, Madawi referred to, which is basically Israel along with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, is actually a triad. Uh, this is actually three uh, powers who feel that in a certain sense their world is ending. This is, of course, the oil princes of the of the of the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, from one side. But also you have white evangelicals in the United States and you have the right wing Israeli government of Netanyahu, but also representing, of course, uh, something much deeper in, in the Israeli psyche. Um, and yes, uh, this th this is uh, going to be a, a big problem because uh, they have, you know, they're in a region where they have a free hand currently because there isn't a lot. There, there aren't many uh, uh, checks on their power. Um, th th these are the main points I wanted to, 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 to bring up, and I, I, I wish we would hear, hear more about Sudan and about the second wave of the Arab Spring. Thank you very much, Iyad. Um, so, uh, please, if you have any questions or points to be raised or comments, uh, uh, in the second one, we are going to go back to our uh, speakers. So, please take your notes once we are um, all of the discussions, contribution is over, and then uh, that session also is going to start. I would like to um, go with uh, uh, Professor uh, Courtney Freer. Uh, so, please, uh, your comments. Hi. Well, thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Um, and sorry, just type it. Yeah, please go. Thank, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, it's great to be here, despite uh, you know technological problems that come with the with these kind of meetings. But I wanted to follow up on something that uh, Shadi had mentioned, and which is also connected to some of the comments that my colleague Madawi made made as well. I think that when we look at the increase in repression today, I think it's useful to consider whether this rise in repression, this recreation of the wall of, of fear, so to speak, is qualitatively different from what it has been in the past. Of course, this is not the first time that we see a rise in authoritarianism, in repression, particularly of Islamist movements in the Middle East. But what I do think makes it different is the degree to which this repression has become internationalized. And this is something that Iyad mentioned as well. We see states like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain, and to a certain extent, the Trump administration trans transnationalizing their dislike of Islamists by taking foreign policies in a variety of environments, from Yemen to Sudan to Libya, which are aligned against what are perceived to be Islamist, or at least not anti-Islamist forces. So I think it's worth noting that I think this is a, a fundamentally different type of repression. It's transnational, and that's what I find most most worrying. Um, and yes, as Shadi noted, dictatorships are not fundamentally more stable than democracies. And in fact, um, democracies in many ways can preserve preserve the status quo more than challenge it. Um, and of course, that's by design. But when authoritarian regimes are assisted by international partners, what can we expect? And how do we change this? Um, I think what Iyad said, again, is, is quite useful, that we don't want to send a message that there's no utility in trying to change the negative developments that we're seeing in the region. But at the same time, is the answer then uh, a more involved and more normatively driven U.S. foreign policy? Um, because I think there's, there is some danger in that. We could be returning to, for instance, a George W. Bush era of democracy promotion, which privileges certain, uh, certain political actors over others. So I think one thing that does help is forums like this and, and getting to speak with people who are trying to push forward change in a way that, that challenges the status quo, because I think that this internationalization of repression, particularly when it comes to Islamist movements, is something that, that is qualitatively different from what we've seen in the past and, and has been born out of, I guess, the, this first decade of the Arab Spring. Thank you very much, uh, Courtney. So uh, I would like to uh, go with um, Ma'azam, head of the uh, Egyptian Revolutionary Council. So, now, please. 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to TRT for organising uh, this conference, which I think is very timely and very important. Um, there are a couple of things I'd like to highlight. Um, one of them is the issue of uh, repression, uh, that repression has been continuous uh, over decades uh, against anyone who dared confront the regime. But post the Arab Spring, what we're seeing is something of unprecedented levels of repression across so again, across many sectors of society, because 2011, 2010, 2011 broke something. It created fear, not only uh, it created fear in the hearts of regimes as never before. We know that in Egypt under Nasser there was repression, there was repression throughout the Arab world, and this repression has not stopped. But what happened is leaders or regimes have been on the defensive more than ever before because they weren't just being confronted by political groups, but they felt that they were going to be confronted by a wide spectrum of the population. And that is why we hear from Sisi very frequently when he makes his speeches that he's never again going to allow for a repeat of January 25th. Of course, what we see is dictatorship, if you like, despite its show of strength, I believe that over time it is dictatorship in retreat. And that's why I do think we need to be hopeful, but also very organized and very cautious. Because the second wave, and there will be a second wave and possibly a third wave, until the peoples of the region uh, achieve their rights and freedoms, because we're no different to other peoples across the world. It will take time, but this time round, it may be even more bloody. And yet, it is in the hands of the peoples of the region to take control in a way that can control the situation and limit the violence. But there is also an onus on the international community and the United States and others. And I do think it is worth addressing that very, very honestly and very clearly. The United States and its Western allies need to reassess their policies. Supporting these kinds of regimes does not amount to stability. It does in the short term in, term of, in terms of interests, but the forthcoming explosion may be such that it will harm all their interests. And ultimately, the choice of the people has to be respected. There has been a great deal of mention of Islamists and non-Islamists. Ultimately, there's been a disrespect for democracy. And the country to which I relate and uh, as I relate to all those across the region, but the one where I saw and experienced a lack of respect for democracy by certain forces in the society itself and by the international community because they didn't like the result is that of Egypt. We need to understand that if we open the door of democracy, it has to be for all. All parties need to participate and there needs to be a respect for the results of democracy. Until the United States and others respect that, we're going to continue to have cosmetic change and not real change. And I think one of the main issues we need to look out in the coming years is if some of these countries do see change, it must be real change that offers development and an end of corruption. Because again, one of the main issues I'd like to raise here, despite the limited time, is the issue of poverty across the region. In Egypt, we have 60% of society living in poverty. We have poverty across the region. We have the fight against corruption that is it's not that it's endemic. The idea is that the regimes have sustained corruption in order to survive. They have 
poured in money into projects that have not benefited the majority of society. We have poor health services, we have poor education, we have poor infrastructure. We have decaying states and societies, not only political systems, but societies in which the majority do not have uh, any hope for the future, where we have high levels of unemployment among the youth and among society at large. These questions need to be addressed, and they're the ones that are most pertinent for people, not what political system uh, is on offer in terms of different political parties vying for power, but what development is going to look like and where there can be where there can be accountability and participation so far throughout the arab region there is no accountability and we can see the interference of regional powers of the gulf just because they are very scared they are terrified of change and the united states and we look to the biden administration and i don't say this with shame to get its act right to know that it ha if it's going to decide to be on the right side of history or not so far the united states has not stood by its values i don't know whether it will this time or not but we want to give it the benefit of the doubt supporting the Gulf states that are meddling in the region and causing havoc to the region is not a recipe for stability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maha, for this remarkable contribution. Uh, so before passing to uh, Amarka, um, please, if we can keep the summaries within the time limit, uh, because we need to go for the second uh, round for the speakers, and they will be pleased to answer your questions. Uh, so Amar Kaf, the Executive Director of Imran for Strategic Studies and board member of the Syrian Forum, he himself is from Syria, maybe uh, the most suffering country from the Arab Spring. So I'm very much curious about, uh, uh, about your approach. Uh, Amar, please. Thank you, uh, Rasul, and thank you for my colleagues, uh, wonderful uh, colleagues here. Um, I, I wanted to agree with Iyad, actually, who mentioned that this is just the beginning of a new era. Uh, this is an era that uh, it has deconstructed the, uh, the old world order uh, and has begun the launch of a new order. This new order is chaotic. Yes, it is. Uh, currently, it's not very optimistic, but uh, this is just the beginning of a, of a new uh, development. Uh, this is an end to the monopoly of use of force by uh, traditional armies, uh, new technologies. This is the uh, world of proxies. This is the world of uh, private security companies. Uh, in Syria, in Libya, in uh, Azerbaijan, in, in uh, Somalia, in Ethiopia, I mean, you name it. Uh, and there's countries you, we probably don't even know that they already have uh, these types. So it's an end of, of the central army, the idea that, that, that there's a central army that controls the country and defends the borders. Uh, borders have become porous. Uh, so this is, the, this is not globalization. This is probably post-globalization, in my opinion. And, and so... Uh, this is a new generation, as one of my colleagues mentioned, uh, a new generation of, uh, this is not Generation X or Z, uh, this is probably a, a, a new generation that we probably don't know yet, uh, their positions and their trends and how they will behave in the next 10 years. Uh, this is a generation uh, that is about 65%, I would say, according to some studies, of the Middle East are young, displaced refugees uh, in their own countries or in other countries. The highest refugees that we have seen. I mean, 50%, 60% of Syria's population has been displaced uh, and Yemen and uh, Libya and, and, and so forth. You have a new, uh, a new Turkey, uh, a new Istanbul that hosts uh, over a million uh, Arabs at least. Uh, in the city of Istanbul, you know, a few years back, one of one of my colleagues here said, "Well, uh, you know, all these uh, Syrian restaurants will probably shut down and will integrate uh, into Turkish culture." And guess what? Um, even with Corona, they're popping up more than ever. And so, it's a new face of of what we're living through. Uh, it's an end of the central state. The idea that there is a central state uh, that controls all aspects of lives. It's an end to the ideas that uh, the central issue of the Muslim population is only and solely the issue of Palestine versus uh, Israel. When we now have 
multiple uh, enemies of the Middle East. Uh, you have Iran, you have Russia, you have uh, you know, uh, the withdrawal of the U.S. You have so many other poles um, that pose a, a new uh, landscape, per se. There's no more duality of secular versus Islamist. I, I, I disagree that we have, I mean, I think this is just a, a long, uh, everlasting conversation of, of Islamist versus secular versus liberal versus all that. I think the, the uh, Middle East and MENA region have uh, gone beyond that. The new generation, all the polls that are looking through the new generation uh, that I've that I've looked at are, are looking at trends that are post these dualities and, and binary approaches of the past. Uh, so I, I think, and, and the displacement, which brings us also to what Iyad mentioned, the issue of demographics, a new landscape, a new demographics of every country of displacement uh, that we will only see the results of which in the next 10 years. I mean, the the pre, the last time we've had a major shock, uh, earthquake to the world order was, was 9-11, uh, 20 years ago. And so I think that this is the second uh, wave that will really shake the way uh, our countries operate. We see the populism of Trump is not over, even if he loses election. Uh, and it seems that he's, lo he's lost, but populism have not lost. Uh, it's, it's, it's still uh, up and running in Europe in terms of Islamophobia, in terms of xenophobia, all these types of movements. Uh, the, this populism that, that uh, has shaken the confidence in, in, in the elections, the U.S. elections. Uh, we're not going to see the results of it in the U.S., uh, probably not now, but probably in 10 years from now that, that you will see a, a new generation come up uh, that have lived through these. So I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, uh, to, to, to say the least. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Ammar, for your contribution. And uh, uh, Professor, Assistant Professor uh, Elizabeth Nugget at uh, Yale University. So uh, please, very curious about your contribution. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to TRT World and also to all of our esteemed um, discussants and presenters. So I actually wanted to build on what um, Ahmad was just saying in terms of um, the amount of displacement that's happened in the region, but I guess from a, a more uh, positive stance, right? So on the internationalization of opposition, um, so many key actors are now outside of the countries in which they, you know, essentially are opposition. And so this has been at the top of my mind recently because I'm thinking a lot about 10 years down the road, um, a combination of dislocation and mental health aspects. How does this continue to um, affect mobilization by opposition? So, you know, we have touched a little bit on Tunisia being maybe the only success story, although it's, you know, not a perfect transition, it's still ongoing. Um, but one thing that was really key about that transition is that the opposition relative to other oppositions was much less polarized, both in terms of affect um, and preferences. Um, they were able to work through really difficult decisions and come together. Um, much of that was forged while in exile in the 90s and the 2000s. And so I think that's a really interesting thing. You know, I've uh, started to do some research on the Egyptian community that's outside of Egypt. Um, Right now, they're starting to do a lot of studying of what the Tunisian example might tell us for new opposition in um, a new era. So I wanted to ask our, our discussants, excuse me, our presenters, um, whether or not you could comment on these developments. Do you think that this um, moment of exile, this moment of displacement might actually have a positive spin to it, right? An internationalization of opposition um, and the ability for actors outside of the country uh, to influence both international governments and uh, the local governments back home. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. So uh, for in our second round, uh, we're going to get the uh, questions to the speakers, but before uh, that session, uh, I would like to go to uh, Professor uh, Yasin Aktay. Also, he's an advisor to the chairman of AK Parti, the ruling party uh, in Turkey. So Professor uh, Aktay, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks to the presenters for their very brilliant <coughs> uh, discussion. And uh, I want to mention first the dilemma that uh, Shadi talked about. Uh, I think it's very important and it looks like 
it would be uh, more uh, deep, deep, uh, deep uh, because it will be more uh, determined in the future. Yes, the Western uh, uh, countries, either European Union or the United States, uh, likes democracy, uh, that, like, dem like the democracy, but uh, they are not. They, they don't like it. it. It looks that they don't like it in in the Muslim world. They don't. They like. The democracy in their in, in their world and they are afraid of its consequences of course in in the in the muslim world as uh, shadi mentioned very uh, good and and uh, i i remember that we were uh, very familiar still we are, we, were, we are uh, witnessing many many discussions in some academic intellectual uh, or political discussions about the compatibility of islam and democracy uh, in the western uh, circles i mean and uh, now, uh, the, the, these were uh, really very boring, and that, that is, we, 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 which were questioning the relationship of Islam and democracy and the values of Islam, whether Islam is compatible with development, with uh, democracy, with human rights, etc. But now, uh, after the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring made it very, very clear, and uh, we, it, it appeared that. Uh, it, it became it, it beca became very clear that uh, where we see the real enemies of democracy in the Muslim world are not the Muslims and are, are the, even are not, not the Islamists. And we see now in the Muslim world those who are seeking for more democracy are the Islamist movements. And the Islamist movements are more democratical and more, more seeking more more demanding uh, democracy in the Muslim world. And that dilemma looks it it will be deeper in the future because. It looks like I mean uh, the 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 Western countries, especially the the enemies of democracy in the Muslim world, have much, very ontological reasons for this. They feel ontological, not to say of course it's necess necessarily ontological, but uh, it it is not necessary to threaten. I mean, democracy is threatening the, the Western world. That it is not necessary indeed. But uh, the, 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 the the expectations they are setting in the in the Muslim world, unfortunately, is based on the absence of democracy, not on the on the very existence of democracy, especially the very existence of Israel in the in in the in, in the Middle East and uh, Israel. Israel is fearful threat. I mean, uh, ontological threat from the development of democracy because the consequences of the applications of any sort of uh, or any level of democracy in the Muslim world brings the Islamists in in in, in power, and uh, they they are they are feeling uh, that the, the, the tyrants or the dictators are much much better than the than uh, than the, the people who are coming with the, with democracy, and this is not uh, not constra constrained or not limited with. Uh, Israel only, but with Israel, with the uh, with, with the with the Middle Eastern Arab uh, dynasties, uh, the monarchs are also uh, afraid of the development of uh, democracy, and this uh, is uh, making us, of course, to look like to, it will be ma making us much much uh, pessimistic about the future, of course. But and, and on the other hand, of course. During the Arab Spring, we were feeling very, very optimistic about the role of new, uh, new instruments or new, uh, new means of uh, participation, new means of par participation like social media or the media itself. And the media, I, I remember one word was uh, mentioned about the role of media in the in the Arab Spring, saying that if if these Arabs, if these media uh, was in the 40s, it would be impossible, for example, uh, the establishment of uh, Israel, because this has played very good, very important role in making people. But then, uh, then these the same media uh, didn't couldn't, couldn't preclude, for example, the counter revolutions, and still, in spite of these very active, very strong media with its social sort or its uh, con uh, conventional sort. Uh, doesn't, for example, help in establishing or in making uh, scandalizing the existing, for example, massacres or dictators of the tortures of uh, human rights violations of the uh, Muslim world. On the other hand, of course, democracy versus dictatorship discourse is being right. used not against the dictators in the Middle East, but it is used against, used against Turkey, against Turkey when some sort of violations take place. Turkey, which is still the only democratic experience in the Muslim world, and I thank you for very much for this contribution. And I would like to thank you very present much. this uh, as question also. 
Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, so as we are coming uh, at the end of the, um, uh, the roundtable discussion, uh, Associate Professor uh, Shannon Arthur uh, from at the Koch University and also Senior Fellow at TRT uh, Research Center. So please, we'd like to listen from you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so my comment follows up, my comment and question follow up on several uh, uh, of the comments by uh, Jamal El Shayal, Madawi Al Rashid, uh, Amar Haf, among others. There was an emphasis on the Emirati Saudi, some people also added Israeli axis as a counter revolutionary axis of repression. But I think if it was just that axis, uh, the uh, problem would have been easier to solve. There is another axis, and one could call this the Iranian Russian axis which has also been extremely instrumental in suppressing uh, democratic anti-authoritarian uprisings in Syria, and many would argue also in Iraq and Lebanon. So these two counter-revolutionary authoritarian axes working together, the Russian-Iranian going all the way to Syria and Lebanon in the north, uh, and then the Emirati, Saudi, uh, Israeli axes in the south together have been very successful in suppressing uh, democratic uprisings in uh, almost 90% of the Arab world. It's as if the geography has been partitioned between the Russian-Iranian zone of influence and the Emirati-Saudi uh, operations in Egypt and Libya and uh, Bahrain, uh, among other places. And uh, Jamal El Shayal pointed out to the only a smaller axis that has been in favor of the uprisings, and that is Turkey, Qatar, uh, and the Free Syrian Army, and the Tripoli government, and to a certain extent the Kurdistan regional government of uh, Bar, uh, in Erbil, uh, led by Mesut Barzani. But uh, compared to the Russian-Iranian and American Emirati-Saudi axis, of course, uh, this uh, Turkish, Qatari, Free Syrian Army, Tripoli government axis is so much weaker in terms of you know GDP, uh, military prowess, and many other resources. I mean, in purely material capabilities, I want to point this out and ask a question to all of our speakers. Uh, in the absence of uh, uh, a great power patron such as you know United States, France uh, on the one side, uh, Russia, Iran on the other side, both of which have been instrumental in suppressing democracy in Egypt and Syria and Bahrain and Libya and many other places. Uh, how much do you think these pro-democratic forces can really uh, limit authoritarianism? I'm not very pessimistic because I want to point out two, three turning points. Uh, the coup in Turkey has been defeated, the siege, the blockade of Qatar has failed, and uh, Haftar's uh, Emirati French uh, uh, supported offensive to the Tripoli government has also been defeated. Uh, and Assad government's offensive to Idlib has been defeated. So there are you know, very small pockets of northwestern Syrian, uh, western Libyan uh, and uh, Gulf uh, uh, centers uh, that are still in support of popular government in the Arab world, uh, but this is a smaller network, much smaller than the Russian and uh, uh, American networks. And I want to finally mention in just 60 seconds my skepticism. There is a lot of uh, optimism about, of course, Biden government, uh, Biden administration abandoning uh, the Emirati-Saudi axis. But what will replace uh, Biden's foreign policy if uh, abandoning support for Emirati uh, Saudi axis will simply mean getting closer to the Iranian axis? That's not going to bring much democracy because Iran is no friend of democracy, just as uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and the United Arab Emirates aren't. So shifting between the Saudi and the Iranian axis is not really a solution. It's uh, almost like a devil's game. Uh, you are damned if you go right, you are damned if you, if you go left, and you have uh, very little resources in the way of military political support. Uh, and as a, as a Turkish uh, citizen living in Turkey, with, uh, okay, yes, so uh, thank you very much. I don't want to take any much time. I learned a lot and I look forward to learning. Thank you very much for your contribution. So, uh, Iyad al Baghdadi, president of Kawakibi Foundation, has some points to uh, be raised. Please, Iyad. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your generosity with the time. Uh, perhaps the, the I just wanted to point to certain trends. I, I'm kind of uh, uh, 
picking up on themes that have been discussed already, but I think I just want to zoom in a little bit more. Uh, the biggest trend, of course, that's been running through the region for really for 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 a century is legitimacy. This is this is a this is a a region that has had a legitimacy crisis, and uh, it's a regional order that keeps tumbling from one legitimacy crisis to the next. But I want to encourage because we have been looking at the at the last ten years, and my thesis really is that we need to look at this as ten years out of a thirty year transition. And I kind of want to look at the next 20 years. Uh, and yes, it is true that it's going to be a turbulent uh, 20 years. It's, there's going to be a lot of trauma. There's going to be more collapse. Uh, there's also going to be more uprisings and there's going to be more transitions and more attempts at transition. Uh, but I just want to uh, kind of zoom in on the mentality of uh, an Arab monarch during this time because there are other trends which are also important. Uh, one of them is that the world is moving beyond fossil fuels over the next 20 years. Um, you know, fossil fuels used to be overwhelmingly valuable. Uh, you could count on the United States to move navies and move armies in order to protect oil resources. But uh, by November of 2019, the United States actually became a net exporter of oil, including crude oil. This is key because the U.S. for a very long time enabled the worst excesses of these MENA dictatorships in order to protect its energy security. So one of the main foundational reasons why the United States ended up being so deeply invested in the region is gone. But this is also situated within larger uh, international trends because Western nations, you know, they continue to be very important and very prosperous, but uh, the world is leveling out. There's, a, there's like an international leveling out uh, uh, not only among regions of the world, but even within them. You know, there are more voices from marginalized communities, for example, that are being heard, you know, thanks to, you know, communications, technology, social, social media, etc. Uh, Thank th you. This is also combined with the fact that people like us, you know, people who did not have access to the global public sphere now do. Uh, so I think this, this really creates a situation for a lot of these monarchs that, you know, it, it does feel like, uh, what worked for a very long time stopped working. Thank you, Iyad. For, uh, for if, if it's possible, can you quickly just sum it up? Uh, thank you. No, that that was the main point. I mean, the the whole the whole point here is that it seems for many of these uh, actors that they're actually acting out of desperation rather than out of confidence. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Ahmed Ustal, professor uh, at Istanbul University, please, uh, just please, just let me remind you again, uh, we are running out of time, so we need to go back to the uh, speakers. And uh, so please uh, keep to the point, please. Mr. Ahmed Ustal. Yes, please. I, yes, thank you. And uh, I want to mention that Arab uh, democratic aspirations are still valid, freedom, dignity, and bread they say but uh, like more uh, fighting poverty we, sh we have uh, no need or uh, for to despair because last year we actually seen second round of arab spring with uh, serious protests in iraq algeria that toppled the governments at, le at least and regime in sudan uh, and lebanon and some uh, some level in egypt uh, so we have uh, this is a learning process I think we should now uh, convince the foreign powers uh, that democracy, especially Arab democracy, is not against them. Uh, Obama blew it, unfortunately, but Biden may, may not and should not, uh, because he also won the elections with the help of Muslim diaspora in America. And peacefulness of Arab democracies also uh, should be mentioned. They scare. Uh, you know, about uh, political Islam, I think authoritarianism is more danger to to the peace and because it breeds despair and radicalism. And one, maybe one thing that we should mention about uh, ma majority rights. I mean, normally we, we, uh, the West generally focus on the minority rights, which is fine. I mean, we, they are as important, but as uh, Jamal Khashoggi said, also, majority rights are violated in the Middle East. So we should uh, mention that uh, these anti-democracy camp are not against about Islamists. Sometimes they work with more radical groups than, let's say, Muslim Brotherhood and others. But uh, they, it is the, they are fighting democracy. We should be very clear about them. 
and clear democracy also tone down, moderate many reactions, but poverty and oppression and other things uh, cause more radicalism, which is a which is a major problem. And we should uh, try to find also internal uh, solutions to our problems like military coup, civil war, sectarian war. Some of them can be handled internally or regionally. Thank you. So the dialogue between Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Iran, I think, can help to tone down these tensions that also destroy democracies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Uysal. Uh, and uh, Radwan Masmoudi, president of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy uh, in Washington, D.C. Please, uh, Mr. Radwan. And by the way, let Thank me remind you, you again, we are, we are having a very much strict time schedule. So to keep all things to the point will be excellent because we need to get back to our speakers. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed the discussions uh, so far. I'm actually uh, in Tunis, Tunisia, and I'm not in Washington, D.C., and I've been in Tunis for the most of, uh, of the last uh, 10 years uh, since the revolution. I, I agree with a lot of what was said, but there is a point that has been missing that I want to emphasize in just one or two minutes. Uh, we've been talking a lot about regional actors and interference and all that, but the main problem is the internal forces are divided. We do not have a strong united front for democracy in our country, and that's the missing point. That's what we have to work on. The, the Islamists are afraid of the secularists, and the secularists are afraid of the Islamists, and so they are divided. And the, the tyrannies, the dictatorial regimes uh, in, the, in each country and in the region play on those divisions. They, they, they go to the secularists and they make them even more afraid of the Islamic state or the Islamic project. They, they go to the Islamic and uh, Muslim deeply religious people and they say, you know, the secularists are against religion. Uh, secularism is going to destroy religion, it's going to destroy your religious values. And so what we really need, what is really missing now, is a united democratic front between Islamists and secularists. And basically, we need to create a vision for what is a democracy in a Muslim country. How does it work? How does it, uh, what is the relationship between the state and the religious institutions, between the civil society and the religious society, between democratic values and Islamic values. How can we build that balance? I'm calling from Tunisia, and Tunisia is the only exception, the only success story, even though it's relative right now, because we've been working for 10 years on this point. And this is the main issue that is missing in other countries. People killing each other because they are afraid of each other. We need this dialogue between Islamists and secularists so that we have a common vision what a democracy would look like, and then they can trust each other and work together to defeat the oppressive regimes. Thank you very much, Mr. Radwan. And uh, just before going to the speakers, uh, wisdom professor at LAC Middle East Center, Madavia Rashid, has some points to be uh, raised. Please, if we can keep it reasonably short because we need enough time for the speakers. Thank you. Uh, Madavia Rashid. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for very, very interesting comments coming from different perspectives. I just have a comment about two issues that were talked about. It seems that in the panel uh, uh, we are divided uh, between the optimist and those who uh, perhaps uh, uh, pessimist. I think we need to be realistic. Um, at the moment in the region, uh, uh, oppression is uh, funded by, by a lot of money. But as, men, as Iyad mentioned, you know, oil is no longer important for the, inter, uh, for the US at least, but it is still important for Asia and for Europe. And yes, it will take time before the dependence on Arab oil uh, is, is uh, gone. Uh, but at the moment, uh, I think we, we really need to be realistic. Um, everybody talked about the youth and the young generation. Uh, yes, there is a, a very, very huge cohort of young people in the Arab world. 
Please, let's not idealize the youth. Let's remember that the youth are a constructed category. They could be very democratic, non-sectarian, pluralistic, but also they could be terrorists, uh, attracted to certain uh, ideologies that uh, make them uh, sacrifice their own life in pursuing uh, projects that are idealized or they are indoctrinated to, to, to follow a, a very, very violent path. So uh, the, the problem is this generation, yes, it has always been diverse and we can't just say that uh, it, it, it is a, a mass of homogeneous young people. It is diverse as much as the adults are diverse. And the second uh, point that uh, Professor Nugget uh, raised about the internationalization of opposition uh, in the Arab world. Uh, the Arab world has had uh, its flows of exiles, uh, forced migrants, refugees of all kinds. And I think the biggest flow uh, in the 20th century was the Palestinian uh, 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 refugeehood followed in terms of numbers by the Syrian one. But in between these two uh, extreme cases, we had Iraqi exiles, Egyptian exiles, and, and I'm not talking here about those who leave their countries for economic reasons. I mean the people who leave for political reasons. Um, and their numbers are increasing. But what is new in the region is the countries that are extremely wealthy, uh, supposed to be stable, and here I'm referring to the GCC countries, they are now producing waves of young exiles and a new diaspora yeah. is forming. I don't know, uh, 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 I mean, they're everywhere. If you look at Turkey, it's attracting right. some of those exiles from Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries in, in the Arabian Peninsula. But also they are scattered everywhere from uh, uh, the United States all the way to Australia. And we are right. beginning to see a regrouping of these voices facilitated by social media, the internet, and the connectedness that these youth are uh, enjoying and trying to mobilize from abroad. But again, they are not all Democrats and they are not all terrorists. It's a mix of multiple voices, and we will see, I think, in the coming 10 years, who, who will uh, lead. Thank you very much. We're running out of time. Uh, just going back to the speaker, so uh, Jamal al Shayal, please just, uh, if we can keep it uh, reasonably short, uh, Jamal, and then uh, Mr. Yeah. Mukhtar Lamani. We have just three minutes. Please. I'm going to just uh, touch on two very quick points uh, and then summarize on this. Um, I think just to pick up on this idea of the internationalization of the opposition, I think it's a very good point in my point of view. As somebody who grew up in the United Kingdom and seeing the Arab diaspora, I do believe actually that the Tunisian experiment, um, uh, the exile and the nature in which uh, people like uh, uh, Rashid al Ghannouchi and others participated um, in the societies that they lived in. And actually, the opposition was being led by those outside of Tunis uh, directing what was happening in Tunis, uh, as opposed to in Egypt, where the Muslim Brotherhood's leadership was directing those living abroad. And those living abroad weren't actually integrating as much in society. And therefore, as a consequence, the understanding of pluralism, the trust of being able to sit across from a table of, for example, the trade unions in Tunisia or understanding how to deal with specific sensitive issues in terms of women's rights and so forth. Uh, the Tunisian experiment was a lot more well equipped because of its integration into specific uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 sectors within society that the Egyptian uh, Islamist movement didn't. The second point uh, I wanted to make here very quickly is in terms of uh, the concept of, you know, the idea of we, we've come back to the idea of like the Islamist parties and so forth. The reality of it very simply is this, is that if, for example, in Egypt, 
the Socialist Workers' Party of Egypt had won the elections in 2012, there still would have been a coup against them. And the, the proof in that is that the Sisi regime has locked up its own generals because there is no longer any space for any uh, different opinion other than that of the authoritarian rulership that is being directed, unfortunately, by minuscule mini-states like the United Arab mm -hmm. Emirates. I very much agree with Dr. Uh, Shinar about Iran and Russia, and I think that's very important. But at the core, and this is where I'm going to wrap up here, at the core of it, really, we can discuss and we will discuss, and these discussions will continue, about different reasons and projections and where we think things are going. But the reality is that no human being was created to be oppressed. No human being was created in a way where they will accept anything less than freedom. And this means that when you have a population that is being and continues to live under oppression, be that oppression, the authoritarian dictatorships or the theocracies or the Thank illegal you. occupation and the European colonization that has uh, manifested itself in the form of uh, Israel, ultimately people will rise against that and they're not going to request or ask permission from anybody when to do it they will do it when they feel it's it's right and when they can't take it any longer those will continue as flashes and here is where i agree with ayad it is a process and it will continue but ultimately they will secure their freedom one way or the other Thank you very much. So, uh, Shadi Hamid, uh, senior fellow from uh, Brookings Institute. So, please, you. And if we can keep it uh, quick and short, I will be really appreciating that. Yeah, uh, two quick points. First, when we try to envision an optimistic scenario, it's very difficult to get past uh, the role of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So, I really appreciate what Courtney said about uh, emphasizing the internationalization of repression. That wasn't the same context in 2010 and 2011. So this is a new variable that we have to um, take into account. And unless the U.S. really steps up and puts serious sustained pressure on Saudi Arabia and the UAE, it's very difficult to see how, for example, the Emiratis wouldn't fight to the very last moment to prop up an authoritarian regime in Egypt if there was a mass uprising. And that's where it would probably get quite bloody. So I, I just don't know how we look beyond that. The second point um, in response to Elizabeth's comment about um, uh, the role of exiles, if you look at um, Egyptian exiles abroad, there's very little room for optimism there. They have not replicated the Tunisian model I would say they're, at, they're as disunited as ever. I mean, just take, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood in exile in Istanbul. There's basically two Muslim Brotherhoods now. They can't stand each other. They don't get along. They don't talk to each other. So if you, if you have that kind of division, even among the same group itself, how do you envision a situation where secularists and liberals will be able to get along with Islamists? That's another step. And again, it's very hard to see Thank how that happens at this point. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador Mukhtar Lamani, we just have only one minute, please, and strictly uh, my friend are imposing that on me, please. Only one minute. Well, I have many things to say and so many comments, but let me be very, very brief about some issues. First of all, we have to have a definition. What is the Arab world? Is it a really a reality or there are subgroups? Because as originally from Morocco, just to give one, one example, one very shocking example, wherever in the world, when you study geography and history, they are linked. A portion of territory, what happened there. In Morocco, when we were uh, studying uh, history, we were coming with Amr al-As and Uqba ibn Nafi from the Middle East to North Africa. What happened before Islam in my own country, we don't know it. A lot of people, nobody knows, for example, that Saint Augustine was an Amazigh. So you have this diversity the, that when you see the Arab world, what is uh, the role of the others, the Amazigh, the Kurds, uh, the Christian, there are so many issues. Secondly, I definitely agree that, that the elections in, in Egypt for the first time were democratic, but the agenda that the Muslim Brotherhood has for the change put a lot of people, Egyptian people, so scared that they have only two alternatives, Islamists 
or the, the military. And the fight, of course, it's not the solution what we are having. Democracy should be inclusive for everybody, but everybody also should respect the constitution. We need education. We need a new education about our own future. And the last comment I would like to say, of course, when I was studying in, in France, it was so nice living in a democracy, as the French proverb said, ce ne sont pas les ingrédients qui comptent. It's not the ingredient you put in a uh, to have a good meal, but the way the chief is doing it. Uh, we were so used that when the American crossed the Atlantic Ocean or the European the, uh, Mediterranean Sea, they were very supportive for the most bloody regime for their own interests. So the uh, people that were talking about internal solutions, this is the first thing. And of course, because of the lack of time, but many other comments that we have to respect. On, on behalf of TRT, I thank you all very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador Mukhtar Lamani, uh, Shadi Hamid from the Brooklyn Institute, and Jamal Al Shayel from uh, Al Jazeera Network, and all of the esteemed discussants. It has been really uh, insightful for me, and I believe uh, for all of the participants. Thank you very much on behalf of TRT. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.